Okay, our next presenter is Cherie Colburn, and Cherie is a professional landscape designer, particularly with native plants. She's also a prolific writer, having written many articles and some children's books. So here is Cherie to talk about using natives in your landscape. I'll let you do it, Carolyn. I think you're good. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, I don't have, I have a little bit stronger voice, so if I'm blasting you out, let me know. I'm going to be talking about integrating natives. Now, I'm speaking, um, preaching to the choir here for the most part. But if you don't know a lot about native plants, I'm trying to win you over. I'm going to go ahead and give you my agenda right up front that I'm, I'm trying to win you over to native plants. I have to be honest, though, as a professional landscape designer, next year will be 30 years in um, four of the different ecoregions of Texas. And I'm not a purist. I grow a lot of food. I grow a lot of plants that I remember from my two grandmothers. One was a professional florist, and the other just could grow anything. My dad, a dentist, he had a greenhouse, so that's just what I grew up in. So I have chenille plant here, that's the ground cover, which was my grandmother introduced me to in the 1960s when it first came to the United States from Malaysia. It's great in hanging baskets, but I use it as a ground cover. Now, not many of the butterflies, some of the moths understand it, but the butterflies don't get it yet. So um, if you're trying to bring in the pollinators, it's, it's not necessarily a good one. I'm doing it because I love it and I, it reminds me of my grandmother. But just up above it, you'll see Turk's cap. Turk's cap is a great plant for pollinators, especially the hummingbirds. So in, in integrating, and we talk about keeping it local, it may not mean what you think it does. Okay, there we go. My grandchildren, one of which is in here, one of the four, are eighth generation Texans. This was one of the first Texans, my uh, grandfather, great, third great grandfather that came. We call ourselves native Texans, but plants are not that way. They can't be here one generation and call themselves a native Texan. So when you see something that has a tag on it at the store that says native Texan, be a little bit leery about that because that doesn't mean you should be growing it. These are the Native Plant Society's uh, vocabulary words that I hope you will remember for today. A native is a species that it's evolved or it occurs naturally. Now, we weren't here thousands or maybe millions of years ago, so we don't really know what has occurred naturally. I've had my DNA done. I know where I come from, and it ain't Texas, guys. I'm Scottish, Irish, English, a little German. Non-natives is a species that does not occur naturally. And we're going to talk a little bit more about ecoregions because that's what I want you guys to, to leave with today is what ecoregions are. And now an invasive is the other one I want you to, to, to really concentrate on. That's a non-native and its introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm to humans or to our pollinators, and that's what I really want to concentrate on today. So why landscape with native plants? My mantra for landscaping is first do no harm. Hippocrates came up with that. It's not my original thing, but the first thing I want, I encourage people to do, look through your landscape and find if you have invasive species and get rid of those. How I'll, at the end of this, I'll have a list of the places you can check to see where the invasive species, which ones are invasive species. This is a beautiful place if you ever get to make it over into central Texas to look at wildflowers. Don't miss the Sutherland Springs Cemetery. Beautiful wildflowers there. So the three reasons that I grow natives, stewardship, ecology, and they're well adapted. You guys remember this, Snowmageddon last year? Everett, you remember that, right? My grandson, my grandchildren bought, uh, did that fort. You've been here when the floods have come. It changes all the time. The plants that are native here are used to it. You're not going to throw them any curveballs. 
So what we're used to looking at when we go into a nursery is the USDA plant hardiness zone. While that is important, I want you to start to disregard it. All right, don't tell USDA on it, but um, on the USDA, it'll say zone. Like on that plant, it says four to eight. We are typically around seven to eight. It depends on the year, guys. Sometimes we're a seven, seven B, seven A. I mean, you get that gets all into those little A's and B's. And we have a cold front come through, a blue norther, and it's going to make a liar out of them every time, just like our kids and grandkids do. So the thing that I want you to pay attention to is not if it says Texas on it. Have you ever looked at Texas? It's a big place. What I'd like you to pay more attention to is our ecosystem provinces. Now there are different levels of ecosystem maps and I know it can sound confusing. Level one, level two, level three. What they're doing is they're adding more information. You just decide how much information is too much for you. A level one is not going to include the soils. It's just going to be mostly the environment. It's not going to include the soils. The more in depth you go, a level two or especially a level three is what you'll find most of on the internet. A level three map, a level four, a level five will even show you topography. Where's a hill? Where's a valley? It makes a difference. Water runs downhill, so it makes a difference. So when you look at those maps, it is a little bit confusing, but I want you to recognize something. Do you see state lines there? Pollinators, critters, they don't know state lines, guys. It's a made up thing. It's government that does that. So local is not necessarily what's sold as a native Texas plant. Look at this. We have more in common with Arkansas than we do with Austin. All right? So pay attention to where those ecoregions are, not just native Texas plant. Now, is it bad to grow a West Texas plant? I have plenty in my yard, but recognize they may not make it because if I give them too much water, they're gonna conk out. They're gonna, they're gonna just be in bad shape. My daughter made this little map, but it shows a level one. It's a little bit more general. We have the, the piney lakes, I mean the piney woods, the prairies, lakes, Gulf Coast. Yours may be in any one of those. Most of us are going to tend towards the piney woods, but we have a little bit of, of everything in our area. I'm going to concentrate mainly on piney woods region today because that's what most of us are going to be in. But when you go to a higher level map, and again, look at ecoregion map on, for Texas or for East Texas, and it will show you exactly what kind of soil you have at your house. The other thing that, that we forget, as I mentioned, the DNA showed I am not a native Texan. The native Texans who were here migrated. And so we may have some plants that have been growing here for hundreds, maybe thousands of years that are not original to our spot. But if it's made it that long, I trust it. I think it's going to do just fine. When people want to grow for butterflies, this is, this is one thing that has really broken my heart to see. A lot of times we grow plants because they're easy to propagate. That makes them inexpensive. When they're easy to propagate, often that means they're not a good plant for our environment. Okay? So a milkweed is an example of that. One of our natives, and we have several in this area, is Asclepius tuberosa. Tuberosa is going to be pretty much solid orange. The one you will almost always see grown because it's super easy to grow is the tropical. That's going to have some yellow on it. That is not our native milkweed. Now why is that important? Um, I was talking with someone today that said I went through and pulled up, a lot of people call it Mexican milkweed because it is for, from further south. I pulled up all my Mexican milkweed. That's what we need to do if it's still blooming because the monarchs should not be here right now. This is their main food. And it's great in the summer when we have it out for them. We're going to have tons and tons of monarch uh, caterpillar. But if you leave it, right now it's still blooming. It's not going to signal 
the butterflies to go south. They're to go south where this is actually native into Mexico. But there, there is a, there are two distinct populations of monarch butterflies, mm -hmm. and one is residential here year round. The other migrates through. Okay. So, so the the residents are feeding on. The so they were okay with that one. All right. Well, you know that. I don't know the difference. <laughs> they, look, they, look they look exactly alike. Are them. they smaller? No. Okay. All right. Well, in, in my again, my, my mantra is do no harm. And so for me to, to grow one of the natives, I think, is a better solution than trying to, to do something that's from further south. So I read an article in one of the you know, freebie magazines that you get that's like basically an infomercial. And their articles are typically pretty good, but the author of this article said, well, you need to plant more natives like Nandina and crepe myrtle. And I just cringed. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to do something about it. So I wrote to the editor of the, yes, I'm one of those people. I wrote to the editor of the magazine and I said, you know, just because it's been here again for a long time, don't assume it's native. It may be doing more harm than good. And explained to her that not only is Nandina not native, it is an invasive species. And one of the end of my slides, I'm going to have websites for you to look at to see what are invasive species. Invasive species is something that takes over for the things that we need. And that's why it's important that we not have them. And as you well know, dandelions can grow anywhere. Um, they came from Europe with the settlers because they ate them, they were medicinal. They're great, but they take over from our naturals. All right, what does it mean to integrate? Again, I'm not a purist, and some people in here are going to do like this at me because I don't have all native plants, okay? I am not a purist. I grow a lot of food. I grow a lot of heirloom plants because I love those. It's my yard. But I make sure that I have a lot of natives in there. To integrate is to blend. So in introducing people to native plants, if you are, that's your thing, and a lot of you, that's your thing, Sometimes it's best not to say, you need to rip out your whole yard. That doesn't usually go over. Just encourage them with taking out invasives and adding in natives. When you think about the plantings, we're going to look at canopy, understory, and then grasses and herbs or ground covers. Those are just basically the categories that we're going to look at. Um, canopy, I love, love, love magnolias. I hate, hate, hate developers and builders that put them 10 foot from a house. I have seen them move swimming pools and foundations. So just because it's a native doesn't mean it can go anywhere. Look at what it likes in the wild. In the wild, this needs 80 to 100 feet of clearance. It's not going to go well into a neighborhood. Yes, we have some cultivars that are smaller. They're not going to get as large, but they still have an extensive root system. For a tree, think about the whole tree and remind yourself that to, in order to keep that much tree on top, it's got to have that much tree below the ground. That means the roots are going to go out that far. Give it some room. Here's just a few of my favorites. Um, this is not even close to all of them, but these are things that I'm, I'm seeing more people use and I'm excited about, mainly because a lot of these are, are pollinators. These are great for our pollinators. The bald cypress is one that is a wonderful plant if you've got a low spot with about 40 foot around it. You don't put it next to a house. I just watched the guys tear down uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, specimen bald cypress two houses down from me because that sucker had gone underneath the driveway into the pipes. It was a mess, guys. So bald cypress are great. Uh, Montezuma is one from Mexico that doesn't knee up as much, and I love that, but it is not the native. It's from Mexico. It's from the mountains in Mexico. Parsley hawthorn, love that plant. Love that plant. Um, springtime bloom, you just can't beat it. We don't plant enough sycamores. Um, they usually are going to like to be in a low spot. It's, it's one of our wetland indicators. Red buds, there are a ton of different red buds. Pay attention to which one it is. 
We've got Texas, Mexican, Oklahoma, Canada. We've got all different ones. So a red bud is not a red bud, just like a milkweed is not a milkweed. River birch, that's another one that likes the water. When I see it in a raised bed, I just go, oh, because every time it gets hot and dry, it's going to drop every leaf and I'm going to get tons of calls because that's how it, it's going to be able to make it through the dry season. It's going to drop its leaves. Same with the bald cypress. Fringe tree, I love fringe tree. Now, most of these are going to be spring blooms because that's when a lot of our pollinators come through, all right? But, uh, Careful, fringe tree, I'm sorry? Chinese French tree is pretty common in the nursery chain. It is. It's more common because it's prettier. <laughs> the, ch the Chinese French tree is very pretty. And it is not one that does harm. It is not an invasive species. So I have one in my yard. <laughs> but I also gr grow the French trees too. The native French tree. Um, any questions about any of these? Or someone else have a different plant that is their favorite shade tree? Now, these are shade trees. So when people say to me, well, I want a drumming red maple in my grass, my lawn over there. I say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Shade tree, lawn. I would suggest an oak of some sort because they, they support so many different insects. Absolutely, absolutely. We have tons of great oaks. We've got willow oaks, water oaks, um, holly oak. We've got, we've got a lot of great oaks. Live oak is not a native here. Live oak is a Texas native, but it's not native to our area. However, it is not an invasive species, okay? And that's the first thing you look up, look at. Um, let me go back for just a second. The pine, did I have it on here? Yeah. Oh, thank you. The pine, oh yeah, with Everett on there. That's, uh, we own a, a pine tree farm in Cherokee County. Um, the, the pine is wonderful for a lot of our pollinators, the moths. This is a luna moth. That's one of the main things that it goes to is, is the pine. Nectar, it doesn't have mouth parts. No, 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 it doesn't. Uh, that's true. So what happens with uh, uh, luna moth, it does not have, it has such a short lifespan, it does not have any mouth parts. It never eats. It never eats. It gets all of its energy while it's still in the pupil state. And then once it comes out, it's got just a few days to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then go on its merry way because it's, it's not going to last very long. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't have any mouth points. Think parts. Thanks for bringing that out. But um, another redhead, uh, red cockaded um, woodpecker is pine tree specific. I mean, it will do some other things, but not only is it pine tree specific, it likes them to be at least 30 to 50 to 60 years old. So when we cut down our big old pine trees, we've lost species habitat, and that's one of our endangered. These are some great vines, and I like to think of these as shade structures too, because if you put something to, to start them on, now the, the cross vine, this is, this is one of the cultivars, this is Tangerine Beauty. Evergreen, coral honeysuckle, evergreen, Carolina jessamine, evergreen. If you have a space where your trash cans are, put up a little bit of a structure there, get some vines growing on it. Now we go to understory. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my neighbors, and I, I'm, I'm not a big poop ball shrub person. I'm, I don't trim much. Um, but the difference between a dwarf yopon making it through snowageddon and an Indian hawthorn making it through, it doesn't. It doesn't. So I love to use dwarf yopons rather than the Indian hawthorn or the boxwood. And people say, oh, it doesn't bloom. Indian hawthorn blooms for what, three days, four days? I mean, there's, there's not a good reason to plant an Indian hawthorn, period, period. Here's some of our understory wonderful plants. Uh, we have several native plums, and I, I know it says Mexican plum, so you would assume, but we do have Mexican plums here. Now, are they here originally? I don't know. The Native Americans use them for dozens of things, so maybe they brought them in. We don't know. Birds bring them, squirrels bring them, but we do have them close by. Wax myrtles, wonderful evergreen native, big shrub. Now, these people that plant them in front of their window that goes down to about two foot from the ground, it ain't going to work, guys. It just isn't going to work. They need some room. Button bush is another one. That's a great wetland indicator. If you've got a spot in your yard that stays wet all the time, that's what you want is a button bush. 
The uh, Turk's cap I mentioned earlier, Turk's cap gets big. Now, every once in a while you can find there's, there is a dwarf that only gets to three foot, four foot, but most of them are gonna be pretty large. Beautyberry is wonderful. I mean, what other plant looks like Mardi Gras in the fall? You know, it's such a great plant. Um, sassafras, love the, the fall color on them. They're so pretty. And so many of these, once you find some favorites, look at all the information. USDA has a lot, and again, I'm gonna have all these websites at the end of this, just take a picture to look for those websites, but a lot of these, Beautyberry makes a great jelly. A lot of, I mean, the Native Americans ate here before we got here. The food is here. We just don't know how to use it. This is uh, Bluebells, what ice cream was named for. So I like the ice cream sometimes better than the flowers, but in fact, this was taken um, in Montgomery County, East, East County. Here's some of my favorite uh, perennials, grasses. Um, these are all wonderful pollinators. That The little violets, that's Missouri. If so the kids did crafts out here, we, we, we did crafts with those. That blooms now. It's starting to bloom now. So a lot of the moths are going to go to that. A lot of our bees are going to go to that. Um, mist flower is going to be primarily with the fall pollinators. And there's a white mist flower now. And I think I got it at Nature's Way last year. Um, the sage's frog, frog fruit, wonderful ground cover, sun or shade. Takes tons of water, but it, it's okay if it dries out. It'll, it'll start to lose some leaves, but it, it's a great, great, great um, ground cover. I know I'm flying through these, but is any questions on, on any, any of these so far? Uh, coneflower, you know, there are a lot of different um, coneflowers now that are available from seed. From seed companies. This, this is our native. Um, we actually, I think, have two that are native somewhere in the county, but um, I don't see the pollinators go to the, the other colored ones. I have some orange and a yellow. I don't see them go as much as to the natives. And I was talking to John Ferguson earlier, and he does a lot of, at Nature's Way, test gardens to see a cultivated variety or non-native non versus a native, and they go straight for the natives every single time. They're not stupid. They've, this is what they do. They're gonna, you're going to have to introduce them to the other ones. They don't know them. They're, they're not intimate. It's stranger danger for them. Pollinator gardens are wonderful, but they're not pretty year-round. That's another thing we have to, to warn people about. We're used to you look good every day or you're out. And that's not realistic. We go through stages. I have bad hair days. You know, we go through stages. And that's something to help um, people who have not grown natives before understand. There are seasons to us. There are seasons to plants. And not only seasonal as in the different seasons of the year, but stages for them as well. If you, if you do things where you overlay, like I will have my spider lilies going at one time and then right behind that or right in front of that will be the cardinal flower, they're going to bloom at different times. So you have things going all the time. Just be sure they like each other. If you, most again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in here, but if you've not before uh, looked into looking for a landscape uh, certification, the Native Plant Societies is great. That's Bob and some of the other folks that work on that. That's a great way to do it. When's the next one coming up? Do you know? March 12th, 13th. March 12th, 13th. USDA, even though I don't like their, um, their other lists necessarily, they're a really good place, besides the Native Plant Society's website, to look to see where things grow. Now, recognize on here it shows the counties. Pollinators don't know counties, right? So if you're on a hill with a lot of sand and a little bit of clay down low, that's very different than someone who's right in a loamy area where there's been pine forest for years and years and years. So know thy soil. 
Know where you live. Get familiar with what's around you. Take walks and look at what's around you, what's growing already. But the list um, from USDA are really pretty good. So here are some of the resources that I highly recommend. Of course, our own website, but then the texasinvasives.org. That gives you a place to look and, and look at every plant on your property. Guys, if we're stewards, we start at home, right? That's the only place we have relative control is at our house. So that's where we start. So make sure you don't have invasive. If your neighbor has an invasive, you might want to take them some of that banana bread if, before the bananas get too too old and let them know that, that that's an invasive and you're, you're concerned about it getting into your landscape. There's nothing wrong with that, guys. If your neighbor had cancer, they would want to know that. These are cancerous plants <laughs> and they are taking over our, our, our world. Uh, the Native Plant Society has a ton of YouTube videos about specific things. That, that's a great resource. I mentioned the USDA Gov, the Wildflower Center. They have de wonderful demonstration gardens, but again, you're going to need to come to the demonstration garden here because that is Central Texas, very different from our environment, right? And then Bonap is uh, a very, um, let me see, academic website. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. Okay, um, but if you want a lot of nitty-gritty, that's a great place to go. It's the bio uh, some of North America. So, um, yeah, it, it's you already have to have some information. Don't go in there as a rookie. That's for sure. You have to already have some good information to. I don't think so because I think you have to go to USDA or Wildflower or to get the to get the common name know, to go I know first. It works best if you put in this. Yeah, yeah scientific name and and I mean I think everybody in here knows the different. You know, it's some people call it Latin name. They're not Latin guys. Some of them are happen to be Latin, but they're named after people. It's a scientific name and and Everplant's got a scientific name. I call a bluebell something different than people in Spain call a bluebell. So that, you can't always go by that. I did not, oh, this is one of my favorite authors. Have y'all ever read Wendell Berry? Highly recommend him. He's a Kentucky farmer and just, he's a naturalist. He's a naturalist, he's just, just a great guy. Um, I didn't give away any books. What kind of moth is this? Luna. All right. Gwen, would you give away a book to whom, whomever you think is the, the best looking person in here? Oh, wow. Yeah. I put it up. Yes, but I did not do it to my, to, uh, my parents. Why can you not do it to your parents? Because we already, we, we already have one. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, you pick someone that you think needs that book, okay? Today. <laughs> Any questions? I think she said that she needs it and she needs it. Oh, oh, question. Okay. Um, what about herbs? Are there any herbs that are good pollinators? Yes. Yes, there are a lot of good herbs that are pollinators. They're not necessarily native. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, ageratum, a, a lot of the, the things that we, okay, let's, let's back up from that. When I'm thinking about herbs, I'm thinking medicinal and culinary. The main thing is to find what you use and I promise you it'll be a, there'll be pollinators for it. Either look at what you use what you use in your kitchen or like for me aloe vera or something like that I use medicinally um, and then find out what it's a host for. The way you do that is through that USDA. It'll show, it'll show on that and a lot of them will also be on um, um, on the wildflower centers. Yeah, summer savory. And host the what are the uh, butterflies? Uh, dill. Black butterflies. All, almost all of them like dill. I mean, as far as forage food. So, uh, but the um, almost all herbs flower. I mean, rosemary. <laughs> so they're gonna they're gonna attract pollinators. I mean, the best herb is the one you'll use. Mm -hmm. you, you still haven't figured it out. 
No, I already gave. Oh, you gave one away. You have one more to give away. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I guess, what's your largest challenge when you're, when you're landscaping? Say, you have a client come to you, and they're looking to landscape their house. But you know, a lot of natives, it's hard. The winter time is hard. 